The following program contains explicit Christian values. If you suffer from the notion that all views deserve respect, Randall may not be right for you. Check with a progressive. Speaking the truth when others hold their tongues. Wrestling for justice with left-wingers and crocodiles. Resisting the temptation to keep the peace at any price. The only talk show host who writes his own theme music, Randall Terry. Thank you. Welcome to the program. Ooh, I am on TV, spreading the seeds of social revolution and discord everywhere. Welcome to the program. I love you. I love you. And I love you. And we have a great program for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Day number two, going backwards in history so that we can go forwards in righteousness and justice. What are we going to start with? The Tea Party. Ooh, the Tea Party? Yes, the Tea Party where they destroyed private property, mm, taking big risks, and women's voting rights. Yes, the suffragettes. They play a key role in understanding how social change comes about. You're gonna wanna watch it, ladies, if you wanna be a true fighter and a heroine for justice. Today's program brought to you in part by The Tea Party, where we dress up like Indians and don't feel ashamed. And by women's voting rights, crazy women, fighting for crazy things. That and so much more, but first, a word from Sir Reginald Bling. Just, just turn on the tape, I got something to say. Ladies, listen to me. Do you know why you can vote? You can vote because there were other women who suffered, who sacrificed, who had horrible, unspeakable things done to them, said about them, so that you could vote. And now you say, oh, look at me. I'm a part of the Tea Party movement. But we don't want to be too radical. We don't want to say something that might get us in trouble. Excuse me? If you think you have all that going on inside you, then you better be willing to suffer, girl. Hi, friend. I'm Randall Terry. This entire week, we're looking back at the history of social revolution in America. If we want to get the country back into the hands of righteous men and women, Let's look at the playbook of people who won. Today, we're focusing on the Tea Party and women's voting rights. You learn from these lessons, it'll change your life and it will change the country if you do what they did. All right, we're on the Boston Tea Party. We've looked at the words, we've looked at some of the images, the images of the Indians, and now about 175 men board three vessels Somewhere between 25 and 40 of them are dressed like Indians so that they can't be recognized. They agreed not to say a word. No one talked. It was total silence. They got on board and they broke in and the captain of all three vessels said, just please don't destroy the vessel. There were people that were armed guards who were not dressed like Indians who were prepared to die. Literally prepared to die rather than surrender their liberty and to be without representation and literally become the slaves of parliament. Remember what we talked about courage, being willing to die for something? When they got to that place, they were unstoppable. And so they took 343 crates of tea off of the three ships and began to hatchet them for hours and then dumping the tea into the Boston Harbor. $1.2 million in today's standard of tea was dumped overboard. That is what they did to preserve their liberty. Now, the sacrifices, they were prepared to die, but then it set the wheels in motion for a lot of hardship. The, the British passed what we call the Intolerable Acts. Among them were the Quartering Act, where British soldiers could stay in American houses, where <clears throat> they, they sealed off Boston Harbor and began to starve Boston out. It was horrible. So there was an immediate fruit that was not good. Things happen in social revolution like that. The Stamp Act, together with the Boston Tea Party and all that was going on with the Sons of Liberty and the Committees of Correspondence and the growth of this, this, uh, this fermenting revolution, it led towards the American Declaration of Independence. But something happened before that, and I'll tell you in a second. But first, let's take some questions. Yes. 
You said one of the negative fruits were th was that the men who participated were marked for treason. Were any of them tried or killed at that point? Um, it, it, with the Stamp Act and with the Boston Tea Party, nobody was killed in either of those two of the, of the um, patriots. But it set the wheels in motion for, obviously, the Boston Massacre happened in between those two things. But it set the wheels in motion to seal off Boston Harbor. And it, it propelled the colonies towards armed resistance to the British, which ultimately cost thousands of lives. And I, I want to talk to you again in the closing moments about one speech again made, as providence would have it, by one man named Patrick Henry. Listen to these words. The, the, about a year after the Boston Tea Party, maybe two, the, the, um, the, the Virginians were deciding if they wanted to send another written complaint to the king, and they were going to pass a resolution saying, send another written complaint. And Patrick Henry said, no, the, the time has passed. They've sealed off Boston Harbor. He said, when are we going to have the strength to resist, if not now, when there's a British soldier in every single house in the country? Are we going to gain strength by ear resolution? So he ends the speech thus. <clears throat> There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. Let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. Now, at this point, he's standing inside St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. His neck is bulging. The rafters are literally shaking. People are watching from outside windows just to get a peek of what's going on. And he was such a great orator, and he acted while he preached and spoke. Or, or, uh, so let me, let me show you what he did. He said, is life so dear and peace so sweet to be purchased with the price of chains and slavery? I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty! Or give me death. Everyone sat motionless in the room. One person sitting outside the window said, I want to be buried on this spot. He served as an officer in the Revolutionary War, and he was buried on that spot. Once again, Patrick Henry, with the words, the rhetoric that propelled people to heroic action. Virginia they rejected the resolution to send another complaint. They voted right there on the spot to arm for war, and they did. And if Virginia had not armed for war, America might have lost the war. Virginia was that critical at that moment. You never know what you can do with the rhetoric of justice standing up in the moment when it's needed. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Talk about the end of child killing. And those two things together, the Stamp Act, the Boston Tea Party, it pulled the 13 colonies together as a unified force. It, it created the dynamic of the, the Sons of Liberty, of the Committees of Correspondence, the rhetoric of justice, of revolution, of freedom, of resistance to tyranny, no king but Jesus, of, of delving into biblical law and showing how they had a right to these things. Those things together finally culminated in what we call the Declaration of Independence, and the four references to God that we looked at in an earlier episode. God the lawgiver, God the creator, God the judge, God the provider. That is the foundation of American liberty. It's theocentric. We inherited that freedom. And we're squandering. We're watching it die before us. If you want to be a part of the solution, look to the heroes who were before you and emulate, copy their valor and their success. Together, we'll have a day on the calendar when we literally celebrate the end of legalized child killing in America, and together, we will dance on the grave of Roe versus Wade. My mother used to read tea leaves for her friends. I must have picked up some of her ability myself, because I can read things in alphabet soup, like Randall Terry's name, for example. And Jesus said, They do all their deeds to be seen by men, 
for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the places of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. Huh. Hi friend, I'm Randall Terry. Women's voting rights. Most of us don't know why women can vote today. They didn't used to be able to. How did you ladies get that right? Because some serious, hardcore women fought and sacrificed and suffered. If we learn their lessons, we can get this country back into the hands of righteous men and women and say, boy, boy Nancy Pelosi, enjoy. In today's episode, we're going to look at women's voting rights and the civil rights movement. Now, the purpose of focusing, as we have been, on the historic revolutions of America's past is so that we can take from their playbook. We're focusing on five elements. Remember those five elements with me. Number one, rhetoric. Number two, their images. Number three, their actions. Number four, their sacrifices. And number five, the fruit. What was accomplished by what they did. Slavery is over, that's the fruit. Child labor, over, that's the fruit. America is a free nation. That's the fruit of the Stamp Act and the, the, the revolt against the Stamp Act and the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution. If we're going to end child killing, which we must and which we will, we have to look at the playbooks of those who have been successful in the past. And by the end of today's episode, I promise you, a light is going to go on in your head and you're going to say, I get it. Okay. And this is what we're going to do to end child killing. All right, first... Women's voting rights. Rhetoric. Susan B. Anthony is probably the most famous uh, advocate of women's voting rights. She was a part of the Seneca Falls Convention in which women released a statement. Listen to this rhetoric. First of all, it's genius right out of the blocks because they use the words of the Declaration of Independence. Quote, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. Those words come right out of the Declaration of Independence. So when they used them, they knew that the average American was well-educated back then and that they were using the language of freedom and of justice. Now here's what they said. I'm just going to take a couple quick excerpts, and I quote, he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. Now stop on that one. This is the language of the Declaration. It's actually the undergirding motivation of the, of the revolution because the colonists did not have representation in Parliament in England. They're saying, look, you pass laws for women all the time. We don't even get to vote. This is crazy. I continue, he has withheld from her her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners, <laughs> having to, pri go ahead, laugh, ladies. <laughs> I like that woman. <laughs> having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, and thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides. That's the rhetoric. Tough rhetoric, in your face rhetoric. Oh, shut the do, keep out the devil. Shut the do, keep the Rudy in the night. Shut the do, keep out the devil. GOP gonna be all right. GOP gonna be all right. Some people's idea of free speech is that they are free to say what they like, but if anyone says anything back, that is an outrage. Sir Winston Churchill. Hi friend, I'm Randall Terry. If you want to get the country back into the hands of good people, learn from those who have already prevailed in the culture wars. Right now we're looking at the suffragettes, why women can vote. And boy, if we get some hardcore women like this in the fights that we're facing now, we're gonna get the country back. Enjoy. You see these pictures of women getting arrested. By those principles to ending child killing society is made of. You see these cartoons that were 
in newspapers, both for and against women voting. Again, the images jolting men or withholding the rights of women that they are due. And then, of course, their actions. They had marches. They distributed pamphlets. They broke the law. Friends, listen to me. Susan B. Anthony voted once in her whole life, and it was an illegal vote. Yes, she was arrested. She never got to cast a legal vote. There were other women who coordinated a certain day when they would vote together illegally to force the hand, to press the issue, to get press. And oh, by the way, some of the press was really bad press. Let's talk about those sacrifices. Some of the sacrifices included bad press, people saying ugly things about them, getting arrested and having to sit in a nasty jail. These are sacrifices that were made. Listen to this. The Rochester Union and Advertiser, a paper in Rochester, New York, said about this whole hubbub, citizenship no more carries the right to vote than it carries the power to fly to the moon. <laughs> Evidently, they were wrong on both counts. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if these women in the 8th Ward offer to vote, they should be challenged. And if they take the oaths and the inspectors receive and deposit their ballots, they should all be arrested, the women and the people that work for the government, and should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Ladies, you can vote because of this activity. This is your heritage. Welcome to your heritage. Their actions, I'm sorry, their rhetoric was insulting to men. Basically, they said, you've made us your slaves. You've treated us the way the tyrants of Britain treated the heroes and the patriots of the American Revolution. There were men who did not like the comparison. Their images were insulting, were at times were uh, putting themselves, the women putting themselves in harm's way. These pictures of these women being arrested. The sacrifices of going to jail, of bad press. But the fruit of it was... Ultimately, the Constitution of the United States was amended, and women have the franchise. Women can vote. Bring it around to child killing. Ladies, which do you think is a far graver evil? Your inability to vote or babies being murdered by the millions? Which is worse? It's babies being murdered. Babies being murdered, right. Well, if it took this much effort and sacrifice and hardship and bad press to, to end the tyranny of only men voting, what do you think it's going to take to end child killing? Do you think we can end child killing without at least that much effort and hardship? So look at the playbook of the past and let's bring it forward and begin to apply those principles to ending child killing. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. Read history, read biographies. The best way to study history is through a biography. If you want to learn about World War II, read about Winston Churchill. If you want to read about the American Revolutionary War, read about Patrick Henry. As you see the world through their eyes, you will begin to learn about that time of history, and it's be it becomes very exciting as well. All right, we had the pagan world. Jesus rises from the dead. He says to his uh, apostles, go and wait. He spends 40 days with them and says, go and wait until I pour out the promised spirit that I'm going to send you. Um, wait in Jerusalem. They have the first novena, right? Nine days of prayer. On the 10th day, the 50th day since the resurrection, Jesus sends his spirit upon them. The Holy Ghost falls upon them, tongues of fire, and they come stumbling out of the room and begin to preach, all right? The Christian era in all of its fullness is now born. The first converts are coming in, they're being baptized. It's really exciting. I want to ask you a question. What odds would you have given 
those 120 people in the upper room, of they, their message, and their followers that would come over generations, what odds would you give them? This little band of people in this little hunk of dirt in the middle of nowhere, Israel, of conquering the entire Roman world. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed what you're seeing. If you want to get the entire 14-part series and the training books that come with it, go to the website that you've been seeing. I promise you, it'll change your life and it'll change the country. God bless you.